Okay, so here we are. Uh, first show, number 276. I didn't say to you, I don't think, but the way of thinking about the last one was our celebration. Our live show was like a uh, celebration of the 275th. It was the number 275th of my um, of videos. So it was kind of a bit of a celebration, and you guys really did it upright. It was, the attendance was better than ever. And, uh, <clears throat> and thank you for the bringing in such a nice amount of donations in that evening. That was just a, a great time. Good questions, and we got to them all, I think. And uh, but we, I don't think we got to this one <coughs> because C. Ford says I didn't quite understand what he was trying to say when he mentioned temps and how they push something further away or closer. We're going to try to focus on that. If anyone can see can clarify what he was saying, please let me know. Now I didn't see anything after that, and I probably shouldn't leave it to others to say what I might be thinking. <laughs> it's hard enough. <coughs> Uh, for me to do that. So, um, uh, so let's just get on this discussion. It's, you know, warm and cool is a discussion that's around. Everybody talks about warm and cool a little bit, but uh, some people have made something of a formula of it in various ways. And if any of you guys are part of something like that, <clears throat> let me know sometime what it is so I can tell you the difference between what we do. I think it'll come through in this video the difference between what we do in terms of warm and cool or in terms of our thinking in general about color because warm implies color differences, doesn't it? Uh, and um, it'd be fun, actually, if it, and, uh, very, and, and informative to everyone <clears throat> if something like that's happening. I take it, uh, based on what I've seen from modern guys imitating the uh, Hudson River School, that there's a kind of a possibly formulaic use of it there. I remember seeing uh, also a show in the middle, in middle, uh, <clears throat> I want to say, where was it? It wasn't Amherst, or was it sort of some Litchfield, someplace, some middle part of uh, New Hampshire, uh, I mean, sort of, of, of Massachusetts, uh, of the Hudson River School, and it was uh, very impressive the way they painted the foreground warm and the background cool. I mean, just creating this sense of depth. Uh, it did it, right? Now, we all know that the first conversation, at least that most people us run into, is through Da Vinci and the conversation about aerial perspective, where it is evident outdoors that everything gets cooler into the distance. Cooler meaning, as it were, bluer, or certainly less red, less orangey red, right? Uh, <clears throat> so that's kind of an introduction to it, and it's a truthful thing. I think it's Leonardo who also talks about the, um, the presence of uh, cold notes, on a sunny day, that the shadows are, relatively speaking, the colors of the of a blue sky. So they they, are t they take on the blue in a very, almost dominating the color, th but not according to Leonardo, if I remember reading it. It's been a while, um, but those are the two conversations you see in in with Leonardo. And you got to you must have read the notebooks. Please do read the notebooks. You you you're not doing yourself any service. He's the first guy. <coughs> that is clearly starting to think this whole thing through about nature, the look of nature, that eventually leads to painting likenesses the way we do as, as what I call impressionists, but the way anybody does, just painting from life. If you want that full likeness, he's analyzing the nature of the, scene, of the visual, the scene, which is why he came up with aerial perspective. So um, let's just look at a slide or two. Uh, in the first place, this is Munzel Wheel, is one of the places we get a discussion like this, but the question of what is warm and what is cool, I think of fire and ice, and I think that's a very, um, I just like it because it's compellingly visual. But the fire, the fire is not over here as much as it's in here. The heat is in this section, somewhere in the hot, in the oranges, right? That's typical, right? You can feel it. If you look at the thing as a whole, just look, just stare at it, pop your eyes a little bit. Um, by the way, to see color, pop your eyes, don't blow your eyes. But pop your eyes a little bit and you'll feel the heat in one spot, and, and like over here, much more than, uh, than, than, than here or here. And then over here, you start feeling this other thing called the ice, right? So you'll see that it's just simply the case. It's one of those useful uses of the uh, useful facts about the spectrum itself and about, uh, and the Munzel wheel. This is Munzel, I think both of these things are Munzel organize, organized things. This is useful to know. I don't think you have to take a class in it to get, grasp the, all the usefulness you need out of it. Um, Again, I see that some people want to turn a lot of Munzel into a formula for stuff, and we paint we paint what we see in terms of what it's doing at any given moment 
in a, as a relationship with another thing. You know, I'm saying a color to a color. We're just that's what we're addressing constantly because the field. We're trying to get the harmony of the data in that field. And so for us to put a middleman in between and have some go-between that we just go over and resort to, I've never been able to quite fathom that. But that's another discussion, another day. Let's go to the next slide. And so this is the Hudson River School. You can feel that, as it were, formulaically. See all the warm stuff here. And, uh, and let me get my laser. I understand it works way better. And then all, this is church, and this is Cole. Cole, I, a lot of people take him to be the father of the uh, Hudson River School. These guys wanted majestic, big, um, I don't think word grandeur is fitting, those things, you know. Uh, but Frederick Church, you can see the whole front of this thing is hot. And, um, and the whole background is, relatively speaking, cooler. And then we look at um, Durand, who, you know, some people take him as a, kind of a textbook, I think. But, uh, and I don't, I don't know if this is or not, so I apologize for that being here. I think it might even be churches, but... Um, but you, this, is a, this is a hyper example of it. You know, here's this, everything in the foreground is hot and everything in the background is cool. But it's the same thing here. You can feel the relative heat if you think about the Munzel wheel and back over here, it feels cooler, right? It feels like there's considerably more gen tendency toward general blueness and here a general warmness. And I say, so we can just say coolness. It doesn't matter what the color is when you're talking warm and cool. It matters that, and some people I think want to argue that, that you got the good of it if you just get warm and cool. But if you think in terms of patterns and color play, you don't think that way anymore. Um, you know, greens and blues and all the other things are functions of other phenomena through the picture. But this does appear to be the thinking that was going on then. The foreground is warm, the background is, relatively speaking, is cool. And that helps you get a sense of depth. Uh, conversation that I'm not an authority on, I'm just telling you what I perceived from these guys and by looking at the shows. <clears throat> There's Beerstadt. Similar thing, right? You can feel that the heat over here and all the cools out there. And that would be true of all these. And, and um, by the way, the neutrality uh, that goes in a cool direction is one thing. Neutrality that goes in a warm direction is a different. So whether they're neutral or not, uh, if they're warm, they're cool, they're, those are all th factors. In, yeah, for what it's worth. You know, um, so one thing I wanted to mention, actually, about the wheel here the um, if you look at this wheel, you'll one of the things that you got to make sure you understand, and that is that the idea of intensity is a factor in all this stuff about going forward and coming back. So even though you're in an area like this, where these values are virtually exactly the same as the background, if you blur your eyes a little bit, you can see these things almost blend into the background. So does this one, but they still separate from it. That's not a warm cool thing. That's an intensity thing. So neutrals go back, as it were, and intensities come to your eye. Now that question about projectiveness, it has to do with the idea of um, the speed of, um, the different speeds. Let me, let me think if I can do this, you know, this, the wave, the sine waves, the, the, the all this stuff, the science of, of, um, of, 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 of intensity is about the length of waves and things like that, as I understand it. And, um, and the less, of course, the more neutral a thing is, the less it has to get to your eye. So it takes forever to get there, relatively speaking. So the guys who get there first <clears throat> uh, are getting there on account of their intensity much more than their warmer coolness. But there's a tendency for coolness, and for whatever reason, even if it's just because we're so used to nature outdoors, there's a tendency for us to perceive cool as being recessive. But I think if you just don't look hard at these things, it's hard to, to get these out of your face. Well, these you almost don't notice. So that, it's a question. Uh, but just don't, what I'm saying here is now, just don't confuse intensity with uh, warm and coolness, okay? All right, let's get past, let's go a couple, I think there's one more of the, uh, another Hudson, there's no beer set, okay. Now what I'm showing you here, and this doesn't have to be a long conversation, but but here's Monet, and I'm showing what she, what Monet does. You see, this one is all cool in the foreground. This is all warm in the background. Cool in the foreground, warm in the background. So you see what's happening. So his entire background, relatively speaking, is warm. This other thing, which is foreground, is cool. So you, what I'm showing you is that you don't have to live by formulas. Um, in fact, you will hurt yourself if you try to live by a formula like that that insists on having a warmer foreground than, than background. Now you could say all the things being the same, if a tree in the foreground versus one in the background in a certain light, 
Well, you can't even say that, actually, because there's so many circumstances that affect it. So I won't, I'll, sorry, I, I shouldn't have said anything. Now, this one here is a very nice example of um, uh, all the stuff that's up front being cool. And this is more like what I would tell, you know, if I was having a conversation with Leonardo, when you get something in backlight like this on a cold day and the sun is doing a bunch of stuff, hitting stuff out here, you're going to have your background not being on average more, more, uh, uh, well, what, what am I going to say? Not more intense, but you'll definitely have that, that sense of warm and cool, right? And yet, how is it that this stuff remains in the background? Well, you see that it does. This tree is behind this tree. But so not, that's when the conversation starts getting interesting because now we're talking about a field and the forwardness isn't a real forwardness. In sp it isn't trying to create an illusion in space. It's, it's just an effect on your eyes. And this is a factor in really making a good impressionist painting to get this to come forward as it were. You see what I mean? To project to your eyes faster than this one, right? So that's going to have you're going to have to get the intensity right. But if you use a formula, you'll you'll want to make that cooler and cooler to stay back behind something. And then secondly, of course, then there's the foreground here. All this foreground stuff has got colors in it and all that sort of stuff. But you can see they're all in the cold family, as if the entire light on them is <clears throat> is a very cold sky. The, you know the sky, the ambience of the day, in other words. So that's an interesting phenomenon that gets this in your mind, though, that what we're really trying to do is distribute, for example, reds. When you're talking about a two-dimensional, when you start thinking of things as, a, as already a, a, a painting with just, it's just color patterns, you know, which is really what it boils down to. The realism is a secondary thing, right? And of course, so, so all, anything's possible in the world of real, of the real. And then, uh, but what you really have to do is play well with the, the, the corresponding parts. This is called four trees. You can see how these four trees are all different and their timing between them is different. And there's a lot of fun happening in those trees. And then you'll see the dance of the golds going through in different places on the picture and how, how, how fascinating that is. That's our world now once you become this kind of person. It's not a forward back <clears throat> thing. It's not, it doesn't have this overwhelming need to be forward and back, uh, to project uh, just space in that way. It does project space, by the way. Clearly it does, doesn't it? So it's doing it by contrast. That's one of those things I like to say, though. You never know how many ways projection happens in a painting. So don't assume it's all going to happen with one thing. Keep thinking that through. Work that over for yourself. Wonder, why does this come forward and that one not? And if you had a formula for why it would, like, for example, high contrast. I mean forward visually now, by the way. But you can also say, why does it feel like it's coming forward in space, too? I mean, like, why is it coming forward in space? Why is it doing okay there? Uh, so, but you'll find any number of things, and, and your, your job is to work it over, think it through as you go, and find out that some of those things that you thought were musts to create the sense of forward to backness, they're broken throughout the entire painting, and yet you still come up with, with the sense of the third dimension. So, is it an aggregate, which is what I believe, of the possible things that can happen in a painting, like intensity comes forward, Contrast, a contrast creates separation. Sharp edge contrast creates even more separation. You know, so there's a forward back something. You know, there's a push pull. And how many other things? So you'll find busyness might be one of those things, like take the boat here. That might make an area come forward. But you can have a background area kind of busy and still not get up to the front of this area. I've never had a phone. Have I had a phone bill here before, guys? I need to turn this off. Apologize. <laughs> so we're talking about, uh, you know, and so you can see that some of the forwardness of this thing, as it were, is just the busyness of the tree. So keep that in mind that there are so many multiple things as we go through this. All right. Now, so let's look at Jerome. This is, I like Jerome in multiple ways, but one of the examples that we're just talking about is here's a painting that's cool in the foreground and warm in the background. Now you could say, well, that's a building. Is it reversed indoors? That's a good question. Is it reversed indoors? Uh, this is a, um, this is a, relatively speaking, this is a warm picture. Rel relative to it, this is a cool picture. So there's a warm, cool discussion as well. A picture takes on a general warmness or general coolness. And then a generally cool picture, there'll be warms and cools, right? And, gen and over and above the general coolness of the picture. And that's true in every case. And somebody alluded to that earlier, I think, in one of the other uh, comments. So, um... 
Yeah. Um, this gets me to that place about what makes the thing come forward. So you see the busyness here. This person being silhouetting against dark here. So as this part here is silhouetting against light, makes that makes that separation make it come forward. But here, but here you can have a whole bunch of lostness, and in here you can have a whole bunch of lostness. The combination of them though keeps that group way out toward the front. That combination of effects, stuff like this. Why isn't this coming more forward than this? And then you have a whole bunch of other things like what the figures are smaller, and they have a different kind of an effect on your eye. Because and that's one that's called perspective, right? So you're being influenced by perspective. But everything doesn't depend on one of those things. <clears throat> uh, it's everything about projectiveness doesn't depend on one of those things, but depend on the aggregate in the area you're in, the, all the different things that can tend to cause forward and backwardness. Of which warm and cool is one. This here is very warm. You'd think it'd be climbing forward, you know, in the sense of being a foreground. And it, it isn't, right? So other many other things create... Uh, Create the foreground, create the forwardness of the foreground, including a push, what I, we call a pusher back, which is what that figure is right there. A cutout, a silhouette at the front edge of a picture. Sometimes they're black, usually they're dark. Amel's pictures are full of dark ones. Um, so, yeah. So I think I said what I meant to say in that. Uh, as you look at pictures like this, you might find here that the foreground generally is cooler than the background here. <clears throat> this is more golden. This has more more of the bluer qualities in it, as both of them being yellow. So, um, um, and for whatever it's worth, I'm just showing you ways, different ways that I think about it. Other things about it, I mean, like here's another one where the foreground is cool. The background is pretty hot. Hot sky, hot sun on hillside. Rel I mean, relatively intense. This is intensity, but is it warmth? Um, this is a weak warmness. This is greater intensity, so it's possible you could argue, but that this is actually doing it by intensity more than anything else. But this is a yellow as well. It's a very high-pitched gold in the warm direction. And this, by the way, in this reproduction, I never swear by these things. But just generally looking at this thing, you'd call this a cool foreground. You'd call this a warm background. It's just the general sense of it. And that's about the limit of the use I put these to. You know, it really is useful to think big categories when they're there. Like when you say... What are all the warm elements? It's a good thing. You take this head, this head here, and you take this chair back here, and maybe this thing here, and you begin to be talking about the the warm the warm parts of this picture, and and of course you include this this here as well. There's another case of the one of the warmer parts being way in the background. Uh, so it's another one of those things where it really isn't about that. It's just those things can happen just any which way in a painting. You can have your most intense colors way in the background, the most warmest colors in the background, as I've shown you. Uh, and you can have your most intense colors, too, in the background. Um, yeah, I don't know if I should say more about that. That's, is there one other one? I think that's where we are. So, yeah, I, um, again, when you're looking at Degas, you can't help but being aware of the field, though. And so uh, I'm, I'm much more concerned that where there's something there's interplay. So there's, you call it warm if you want to because it creates a category. Then there's interplay, and that's most of what we're concerned about in this world. You could say that he has a golden feel really rich here, a secondary golden one getting more toward the reds, and then a seriously darker, redder one in this spot and talk about the movement of those three masses as a three, as three tiers of the, uh, of the warm world. Uh, and so on. You might find that he's done the similar thing with the with the uh, cooler notes. You know, with this, this, and others. Um, I just discovered this uh, image. I hope this is. A, I think this is one of the better ones I've seen of this. I, I'm, I think so. Uh, I found this in a. It's in a house in uh, somewhere down in Fairfield or someplace in uh, Connecticut. Um, but yeah, but the, the greater field is not about just simply front and back. Uh, and there are arguments to be made that the, the field, the painting, painting is a flat thing. And what's really interesting about it is the interplay, top and bottom, left and right, of stuff like golds, reds, uh, browns, as they play into each other and set up, they set up this way. Colors do that. Now, you can say they go in and out, but you're not going to, you're going to miss something that's really big and bigger than all the, those ins and outs things. Uh, you're going to miss something by being a realist in the simple sense of that word if you aren't also able to get a compelling grasp of the fact that a particular red, let's say this one right in the middle here, or some parts of this one have a connection to this. 
or that any number of the, go the, the horses are connected in some way to the, to the other versions of gold that you might see around. So I think the summary comment, let's just glance back through these. The summary comment about this whole thing is that warm and cool is a real thing. It's a grand category, much like when Degas says there, you know, there are three to five values in any given painting. Well, even in his work, it's obvious there are hundreds of values. But, we, but they're giving you broad categories, and they're not unuseful. It's not unuseful to think of this as being a cool half of the painting that's a warm half. But to create laws about it, that's where you might get into trouble. Or if you try to say, well, what is this color note doing? And you say, it should be warmer. Warmer isn't a color, and cooler is not a color. You have to say about the color note you're trying to correct, should it be more red, yellow, or blue in relation to, et cetera, you know, and we're talking about all the other colors in the, in the, in the, in the field. So if you understand that, I can't mix colors by saying warm or cool. I mix colors way better by saying more red, yellow, or blue. Now, I may very well notice that it's whatever it is, it's a blue. It's a, I can say it's, a, say it's a blue, but it's on the warm side. And so it's more like a green um, that I'm needing in that spot. You just see what I mean? But uh, to make the admixture, to change the color. But so you, you will notice categories like that, but you still have to hit find the color on your palette, and if you're using a prismatic palette, which is the way I started this discussion here today, you'll be, you'll be um, uh, well rewarded uh, with that strategy. So, yeah, yeah. You know, it's so easy to confuse painting, um, the world of paintings, you know, and just think this isn't a good painting because of this, and that's not a good painting because of that. So many people think that they, you can dismiss impressionist painting, this, even this, even these, because it isn't drawn like, like you know, an academic draftsman. It is the picture is not made along those lines. But until you know how to do this, until you understand this form, that is to say, the interplay of color and color relations, <clears throat> it's very difficult for you to um, to. Um, you really ought not dismiss it. Let's put it that way. It'd be it'd be unwise for you to just simply dismiss it out of hand. All right. So there are the. Hudson River School guys. There's that wonderful Munzel thing. Enjoy it. Get to know it, guys. Play with it. Uh, do something with it. I did it in high school. It was one of those things that was one of the few things that we, I thought was actually something that merited my interest. And uh, and and I worked uh, diligently at uh, trying to figure out what they, they were doing. And uh, it does pay off. But I, our, ballot, our palette basically is related to this. You know, our colors, uh, the colors we use exist like here, and uh, here, and here, and well, Lizarin is wherever that is here, and then this, this, this orange here, and then our yellow is sitting over here. Outdoors, we go ahead and switch over to greens that look like this, and we get some blues that look like this with greater intensity, like the severs. But you can see we're just taking them out of this palette, right? If I said that down here, you'd be able to see it better. The redder, the, the purple that gets the reddest is the purple we use. The, um, this, the, the one that the, um, Orange, the red that gets the orangest somewhere in this range is the scarlet, it's the one color we use. The yellow that gets the greenest is the one we use, and so on. And the cool, the, obviously the cool, the, the um, viridian. So I'm just saying it again, and, and the blue we use is this one down here. But that's the, um, that's the palette I use, and you can see that it's easy to understand when you're painting a given area, the warm, cool thing. And then you still have to mix it out of the individual colors. So, yeah, if I'm missing something, you know, I'm just, I'd be. I'd love to find some more brilliant use of of warm cool than I found. But so far, I've given you the basic background that I have in relation to it. So thank you, uh, thank you, uh, C Ford. Uh, okay. All right. Well, thank you again for for all your kind contributions and help uh, last week for being there. And uh, let's we'll see if we can't do this more often. I'm not sure we're going to make the four week window, but. It's up to my uh, Mr. Producer to go ahead and give it a shot. Um, and uh, also, the idea has been passed around through a lot to a lot of you guys about actually having some you know, live critiques of some work you'd bring in. So that's going to continue in the offing. If anybody else has ideas about it, do feel free to email me at uh, ingbretson underscore studio at yahoo.com. All right, thank you, and uh, see you next time. And have a happy new year, by the way. <laughs>